Hello, welcome to my talk, Real-Time Multi-User Estate Management for the Collaborative Web. My name is Matt Hayes. I am a senior software engineer at Wizards of the Coast. I work on D&D Beyond. Uh, if you're a customer, thank you. I, you probably know my work from the game log. I was on the team that helped uh, bring that thing to life. It is a WebSocket-based communication, uh, a sort of messaging channel that lets um, players share information about their characters, their dice rolls, uh, their campaigns uh, within D&D Beyond. Today, uh, I'm going to introduce this little app I built to demo uh, a kind of alternative uh, set of uh, APIs and uh, different sort of uh, state uh, strategy. Uh, I call the app Super Duper Fluidity. Uh, a state management doohickey um, is available on the internet at uh, kindness is the dankest meme slash super duper fluidity uh, on GitHub. Uh, it uses WebRTC and specifically WebRTC data channels for uh, transmitting actions between connected peers. Uh, it uses WebSocket for signaling, which is part of the WebRTC uh, protocol. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. And it uses a mechanism called rollback netcode, uh, sometimes also replay consistency uh, for state synchronization, which allows peers to make optimistic updates to their local store uh, and uh, heal from getting out of step with the server, uh, you know, whenever, whenever that happens. So uh, before we go too much further, let's look at what it looks like. Uh, okay, here I have a, I have a local server running just uh, in the background. Don't worry, we'll come look at some code a little later. Um, and what it does is, uh, sends um, events from one client to another client. Looks like I got a, a lingering pointer here. Oh, there it is. Um, so you can see as I navigate between these different browsers, uh, it's dispatching their pointers. And uh, not only that, um, but I have my, uh, my iPhone here connected and an iPad. Ooh. Uh, so it's pretty neat. Uh, <clears throat> so this uses WebRTC. It is a kind of complicated API and I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about it, but uh, it offers some really interesting performance characteristics, so uh, please uh, bear with me while we introduce a bunch of new concepts. Um, the literature about uh, WebRTC mostly talks about uh, its use in audio video or voice over IP. It is primarily geared toward that use case. Uh, so that kind of makes it hard to, I guess, learn about when you're first exploring. Um, it also introduces the concept of a peer connection and a signaling channel. The metaphor I like to uh, use here is that the peer connection is like a landline phone uh, sitting on the, on the wall in, in my hallway. And the signaling channel is sort of a, an operator or a switchboard. If I go pick up my phone and, and dial a number it connects to the signaling channel, which tries to find a pathway from my phone to whatever phone that number represents. Uh, and once someone picks up on the other end, we're talking, that whole process that I described uh, is referred to as negotiation in WebRTC world. And the actual sort of part where uh, some, uh, some, some peer and I are communicating with one another uh, is an is an open data channel in, in my uh, in the uh, super duper fluidity example and in 
my sort of general scheme here. Uh, also, uh, part of the WebRTC sort of lingo uh, world here is uh, the notion of topologies, just a fancy uh, word for the way in which peers are related to one another. Um, the first thing you'll see and the set of the most basic setup is a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Um, this is just two uh, computers on the internet uh, use the signaling server to, or use the signaling channel to find a direct path between one another uh, so that they can communicate without necessarily having a central server uh, do any kind of, uh, you know, processing or, or relaying or anything like that. Um, from there, it's not hard to jump to the concept of a mesh uh, network. This is sort of peer to peer to peer to peer to peer. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a, a sort of, uh, logical next step from a peer to peer connection. Um, but for our use case, for my use case here, um, the lack of a central authority makes conflict resolution between peers, um, sort of difficult to reason about. Uh, and also an issue that is more specific to the audio video use case, um, but still kind of an issue is that most, uh, well, maybe not most, but many ISPs are constrained on their uplink throughput. I think it's not uncommon to have like 10 to one download to upload speeds. And if you're one of these peers with uh, three or more outgoing HD video streams, you're probably consuming m most of your, your upload bandwidth uh, pretty immediately. And finally, we have the SFU and MCU topologies. Uh, the U stands for unit, uh, selective forwarding or multipoint control. Uh, in my little diagram here, uh, the, the, the unit uh, is uh, sort of rendered like a server, but uh, nothing, uh, nothing requires it to be a server. It could just be another peer on the network, a kind of super node. Uh, signaling is still involved, uh, uh, involved in this process. I've just kind of omitted it because uh, it gets a little busy with all the back and forth. Uh, but the main thing here is that signaling uh, negotiates a communication channel between, uh, between two peers and uh, the sort of central peer here is relaying uh, information between all the other connected peers. Um, the SFU and MCU, uh, the differences between them are a little specific to audio and video, but sort of generally the SFU architecture, the central node is just a relay. It just sort of rebroadcasts messages to all connected peers. And the MCU, uh, architecture, um, the central the, the central unit uh, is uh, doing some kind of interleaving. So you can imagine a, a Zoom call with a hundred participants. Um, the central unit would take all of their video streams, maybe stitch them into uh, stitch them together into a single video stream with a single uh, codec and then transmit that stream to all the connected peers. Um, our, my, my implementation of uh, rollback netcode via WebRTC data channels is, is kind of doing both and kind of doing neither. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. There's also a little glossary of acronyms we need to talk about. When we talk about uh, negotiation, this is what happens over that signaling channel and uh, what establishes the connection between any two peers in a, in a WebRTC uh, setup. Uh, ICE, uh, Interactive Connectivity Establishment, is the sort of overall mechanism. Uh, STUN uh, servers are uh, essentially like, uh, like a what's my IP address server. It, uh, it uh, finds where uh, uh, an individual uh, computer connected to the internet 
sort of is, what its address is, how it can be reached. Uh, and turn servers are technically part of the RTC implementation. They're a UDP relaying server and are used as a fallback if a stun connection cannot be established between any two peers. Uh, for my implementation here, the central unit is a server on the internet, so if any peer can't connect to that server, I am assuming that that peer just can't connect to the internet, and it doesn't really make sense to have a, another relay that it wouldn't be able to connect to to try to connect to the thing. Um, finally, the sort of RTC negotiation uh, process has uh, had some, um, let's say, complexities of its own uh, as the as the spec evolved, uh, and the the new hotness, not really that new, uh, is a mechanism called perfect negotiation or the perfect negotiation pattern. Uh, it we'll talk about it in a second. I have implemented here, and we'll look at code a little bit later, an almost perfect negotiation mechanism. Um, the way my system works is uh, clients are the only people who ever make calls. They're sort of Im impolite. In the perfect negotiation pattern, there is a such a thing as a polite peer and an impolite peer. It's kind of left to the implementer to figure out who's going to be who. Uh, and in my system, clients are always impolite. They, they only make offers and the server is always polite. It's, it accepts offers. It always answers. Um, but the basic flow is uh, someone triggers a negotiation needed event uh, that causes that, that peer to create an offer. Um, both peers handle ICE candidates over the signaling uh, channel. Um, the remote peer creates an answer, which is uh, to sort of say, okay, let's communicate on this uh, path. And uh, once all that is uh, in place, you have, a, you have an open connection and you can transmit data back and forth between two peers. Uh, there's a cool uh, little internal sort of page in Chrome. You can look at sort of the WebRTC internals. Uh, uh, very technical, but kind of interesting to sort of look at the, the insides of, of what's happening. Uh, okay, so all that said, uh, that's kind of a lot to have in your head, a lot of uh, um, he, sort of handshaking and uh, negotiation and back and forth, just to have a connection, a data connection between a, uh, a client and a server. Um, why wouldn't we just use WebSockets for something like this? Well, it is a valid question, and I think in a lot of use cases, uh, WebSockets are, are, are perfectly adequate. Um, the the uh, fact that WebSockets happen over TCP uh, means that they incur some overhead. They have slightly more headers. They send cookies. Um, there's some sort of stuff to do to uh, limit that. Um, also, and I need to do some investigation to verify that this is still true, but as of, I think, 2016, uh, WebSockets do not support uh, message multiplexing, um, by which I mean uh, if I have one WebSocket channel and I send a large message, say an image, and then I send a, a small message, say like, hello world, the small message has to wait for the entirety of the large message to finish sending before it can start sending. There's no way for it to split up those messages and interleave their um, packets or frames or whatever. Uh, so that can be sort of unfortunate if you have a, a message already outgoing and a time-sensitive message that you want to get across. Uh, further, um, in all of my research, uh, I've only ever seen uh, WebSocket as uh, an HTTP 1.1 upgrade, which means that the WebSocket connection is over HTTP 1, which means that um, most browsers, I think this is still true also, uh, will um, limit the number of open HTTP connections that 
that the browser can have. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if that is connections per tab or connections over the entire sort of browser instance, um, but it means that uh, if you open too many WebSocket connections, uh, one of them uh, could be closed by the uh, by the browser because you've reached the limit of uh, open connections per uh, origin that you're that the browser says is an appropriate number. Uh, there's more uh, on this in the High Performance Browser Networking book, which is uh, just a great resource resource overall, and I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, but anyway, all that said, uh, the particular, excuse me, the particular windmill at which I am tilting is sort of near as possible to triple A video game latency for uh, multiple users in a kind of shared environment uh, in a browser. Uh, and uh, here's where WebRTC data channels can kind of do some stuff that sockets can't do. Um, because RTC data channels are transmitted over UDP, um, and because they have the requirement that they are uh, secure, uh, they implement um, a kind of TCP light mechanism which exposes certain levers and controls to uh, people like me who uh, want to decide if a channel is going to be unordered and unreliable or ordered and reliable. Uh, I'm actually going to demonstrate an implementation that uses one of each uh, for different uh, purposes. Uh, an interesting thing to note here about the unordered, unreliable channel is that you want to limit messages to a single packet. Uh, the reason for that is if your message spans, uh, let's say, 100 packets and you have 1% packet loss, you're highly likely to lose one of those packets. And if you lose one of those packets, you lose the other 99 as well because it can't sort of complete reassemble the message on the other end. Uh, so limit your unreliable, unordered messages to a single packet. Um, for me, I'm, uh, well, you'll see in a minute, but um, I'm essentially sending input events over this unreliable channel, and I think they should fit handily inside that uh, uh, about a kilobyte. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that brings us to rollback netcode, uh, also sometimes called replay consistency. It is server authoritative. It detects uh, desync and repairs those via uh, a sort of server authoritative sync mechanism. Uh, it is less complicated than CRDTs or operational transfers, uh, which are, uh, sorry, CRDTs are conflict-free replicated data types, uh, and OTs are operational transfer. Um, these are both mechanisms that are designed for decentralized scenarios, that is, no central authority, uh, which I'm not sort of interested in uh, for my sort of game state uh, model. And... Um, uh, also appear to be mostly about uh, document editing, uh, whereas I'm kind of more interested in keeping a simulation, uh, you know, mostly in sync um, and, uh, you know, very fast, uh, which leads me to the last uh, reason you would implement something like rollback netcode is that it allows you to be optimistic with local updates uh, and not have to sort of like send the update to a remote, a terminal, wait for it to come back, acknowledged by the server, and then play it out in a, in a terminal consistency uh, mechanism. Your, uh, your game's uh, sort of speed uh, or its feel is uh, really dependent on that, that network latency that you uh, uh, might have. Um, another nice thing about this uh, rollback netcode implementation 
is that the same um, state machine, the state management uh, module runs on the client and the server. Uh, the implementation is uh, effectively a last writer wins register from the CRDT world, uh, except that uh, in our case, the server always knows who the last writer was. We, we essentially use server time to determine the correct order of things. Uh, so it's able to decide the winner and there's no kind of like um, uh, mechanism for, uh, for, for uh, negotiating that between peers or, or decentralized units. And finally, this uh, implementation requires determinism. Uh, but uh, for that, we're going to rely on the kind of um, right out of the box, sort of like Redux style of determinism, which is to say, um, given a state and an action, we get the next state. And if you give this function the same state in and the same action in, you always get the same next state out of it. Um, it, it it's, <laughs> it's probably what you should have been doing the whole time, um, but it's important to call out. Uh, also, because the unreliable, unordered data channel could theoretically deliver the same message twice, um, it's important that our messages be item potent. That is, if I happen to apply the message multiple times, uh, it doesn't, uh, it, it's not, um, it's not additive. Like I, I never want one of my um, action messages to be like add 10 to this number because if I accidentally apply that twice or uh, I have to reapply it, um, I'll wind up uh, adding 20 or more. Okay, so how does it work? Um, well, like I said, the client is optimistic. It applies updates immediately and sends those to the server over the unreliable channel. Um, clients are held in a pending buffer uh, that is just like, you know, these are the uh, unsettled or unacknowledged uh, updates that we've made locally. And when a server uh, gets, uh, gets an update from a client, it uh, essentially acknowledges it and sends it right back, also sends it to any other connected clients which just receive it as a sort of server authoritative uh, uh, action or, or update. Um, when a client gets its own message back, uh, it settles that pending update, uh, by which I mean it rolls state back through any other pending updates, uh, applies the settled update, and then reapplies the pending updates that, that haven't been settled yet. Uh, all of that should happen in less than one sort of 16 millisecond rendering frame. So we want it to be fast uh, and we want the number of uh, updates you need to sort of reapply to be uh, pretty small. Um, but that's uh, essentially how it works. When things go wrong and the ways in which things can go wrong. Uh, a settling update could invalidate more than one pending update, uh, by which I mean um, a, uh, a user could send an update, I click on this thing, and uh, before that, uh, before that, like while that uh, update is on its way to the server, uh, another user already sent an update that is like, I move the thing out of the way. And so by the time it reaches the server, uh, it can't click on the thing. And so it has to figure out a way to send back, you know, if that didn't work uh, or, um, or just trigger a full resync, which is uh, sort of the, the worst case scenario um, uh, where the server is just like, no, you're way off, um, just start over and it sends down the full, the full state uh, over the reliable channel. Uh, we want those to be strictly server to client and pretty rare, um, but there are cases where that might happen. Uh, an important thing to note here is that testing this system should be uh, pretty easy. Uh, in your test suite, you create 
uh, a sort of timeout uh, register of two actors uh, firing actions at different intervals. And once all of the actions have been fired, um, just validate that both of their states are the same. Should, should be great. Uh, a quick bibliography on some resources that I have found particularly useful in my implementation here. Uh, Eight frames in 16 milliseconds is a talk specifically about uh, Mortal Kombat and Injustice 2. Their uh, implementation is peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, but um, they're doing the same kind of like rollback, uh, apply, and then replay mechanism. Um, and the, the talk is uh, really, uh, really well stated. Um, second, this replicated Redux talk uh, by Jim Perbrick from the React VR team at React Europe 2018 uh, also implements rollback netcode in a Redux-like uh, environment. Um, there he calls it replay consistency, but um, uh, also just a great one with some JavaScript source code, uh, which is nice to see. Uh, next is uh, Figma's uh, multiplayer technology. They actually have a lot of really great um, talks on their dev blog or articles on their dev blog about um, some of the different challenges with uh, multiplayer uh, editing and, and kind of the things that can come up. Uh, and finally, implementing undo history from the Redux docs themselves. Um, the rollback netcode is surprisingly like uh, undo redo history, uh, except that instead of waiting for a user to press command Z to initiate an undo action, we just wait for a server action and then we undo and redo sort of on the user's behalf. Uh, before we jump into some source code, uh, just a quick note about the libraries that I'm using. WS is the server-side WebSocket implementation. Node WebRTC is the server-side WebRTC implementation. Uh, ZooStand is a sedate store. Uh, it implements a lot of uh, nice middlewares. It's um, kind of geared toward React, but has a vanilla implementation that um, uh, works in just vanilla JavaScript. Uh, Immer is a immutable uh, update mechanism. It implements this uh, function called producers, which wrap everything in proxies. And so you can do mutations inside of a producer. Uh, and then when the producer function exits, those mutations are flushed to your, to your object. Um, it'll, it'll make sense in a minute. And finally, EVT, which is actually from the, the world of Dino, uh, but uh, it is um, uh, an event streaming uh, library that uh, I'm using almost exclusively to wrap event emitters or event targets in uh, functionality that lets me merge their events into a kind of single stream and then treat them as if it was one sort of reactive stream. Uh, again, more on that in a minute. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is all up on GitHub under kindness is the dinkest meme slash super duper fluidy. Uh, there are kind of four main areas of uh, interest in the project networking, uh, which is the WebRCT, uh, RTC, uh, peer connection, and data channel stuff. Uh, state, which is all the uh, ZooStand, Immer, and uh, uh, well, ZooStand and Immer input, which is mostly EVT, and finally rendering, which I'm just doing with um, uh, the, the vanilla uh, canvas uh, 2D rendering context API. Uh, we're going to pay particular attention to the negotiation logic and the with rollback function, which is a state uh, decorator. Uh, so let's look at some code. Uh, okay, so here's my server running. Here's my entry file. This is uh, the client side uh, sort of mount for um, 
for where the app kicks off. Um, I create my WebSocket as my uh, signaling channel. I create my peer connection instance, uh, and then I pass those two off to this negotiate function, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, but I guess I mentioned uh, we're on the client and I'm going to call this peer connection .create data channel, which is what kicks off the negotiation needed event, which kicks off the whole kind of negotiation process. Uh, my action channel is where I'm going to dispatch uh, essentially input events um, uh, and uh, it is ordered false and max retransmits zero so it won't uh, if it drops a packet it won't even try it does make no makes no guarantees about the order in which they'll arrive and uh, I have a state channel which is uh, another peer connection it's using the defaults uh, here which are ordered true and max retransmits null which Essentially, I think leaves it up to the browser to figure out how many times to retry. Um, this state channel is pretty close to a WebSocket, uh, just implemented in a kind of like UDP layer. Uh, uh, which takes us over to the negotiate logic. Um, so here is uh, EVT wrapping the peer connections negotiation needed event. Uh, I just, um, uh, it's an async function. I set this kind of is offering flag so that I don't like make two offers or accept offers when I've already got an offer on the way. Um, I create a, an offer, a kind of local description saying I am uh, offering to uh, connect. Uh, and then I send that over the signaling channel. Um, there is a peer connection ice candidate event, uh, which is uh, just some kind of like magical thing that happens inside the peer connection implementation. Uh, all I really need to do is make sure that I'm sending those candidates on the signaling channel. And lastly, we have the signaling channel uh, uh, message event. Uh, again, that's just our WebSocket, um, but it connect it accepts messages with either candidates or descriptions, and descriptions can be uh, either offers or answers, uh, which is why it's so kind of uh, conditionally in here. Uh, if we get a candidate, we just want to set the ice candidate to our peer connection. If we get a description, we want to set the remote description. That means it's a, a description coming from someone else. Uh, and if the description is an offer, we want to make sure that we're not a client, uh, not a server, we're a client. And if we are already offering or our signaling state is unstable, uh, in, in any of these cases, we're just going to return. This is sort of the impolite peer. I don't accept new offers. Uh, and uh, I just kind of ignore, ignore incoming offers. Um, otherwise, we will create an answer. Uh, this is the server, the polite server case. I answer all offers and send that out over the uh, signaling, signaling server, which is uh, handled by the negotiation, the same negotiation logic on the client. That brings us back to, uh, once all of that negotiation is done, we're here, we have uh, open data channels. Uh, this is a really nice feature of EVT uh, I mentioned before. It lets me merge uh, separate streams and then treat them as a, as a kind of single uh, stream that I react to. Um, but here, number six, uh, negotiation is complete. We have two open data channels and I'm going to send a client action uh, that says uh, the connection is open. Uh, send client action up here, uh, creates the client action, which gives it a source of client. Uh, and then the type and payload I just pass in, I'm, I'm setting a bunch of uh, metadata about the action that is going across the wire. But importantly here, I, dis I, I uh, send it on the data channel up to my uh, my remote my server and I dispatch it to my local store 
so that it is immediately applied locally and I just let it go and wait for it to come back before I sort of consider it validated or, or however you want to think about that. Um, lastly, I think before we jump over to state uh, messages from the server are dispatched immediately. So here inside of the data channel open event, I wire up uh, I wire up a message handler that is listening to both of those incoming messages on those data channels and dispatching them directly to uh, my state. This is either messages from other peers or messages from the server that are acknowledgments of, of my own messages. Uh, so hopping over to state. Uh, here we are, step nine. This is a reducer that should be familiar to anyone who's worked with uh, React or Redux. Uh, it is an immer reducer, as I mentioned. So inside of this function, mutations to state are allowed. That's how you do it. And once the function exits, those changes are, are flushed to, uh, to the state object. Um, a really nice mechanism here. Uh, mostly I am just building up a kind of blob of clients and their connected pointers, uh, which might be touches or mice or pens or whatever. Uh, but the last uh, bit of code we'll look at and the important part to this rollback netcode implementation is this reducer enhancer called with rollback. It, it, uh, sorry, Siri thought I was talking to her. Um, it, keeps track of settled actions and pending actions and has a an internal kind of inside of the uh, uh, um, closure. Uh, it has a little uh, uh, a reference to the settled state or the last known good state. Uh, this is just sort of like kept inside of the, uh, the closure here. Uh, it returns its own kind of like wrapped reducer. Uh, so if the action source is a client, that means it's my local action. I'm going to add that action to pending actions, and then I'm going to apply it locally immediately. Pretty simple. This is a, this is a sort of a pass-through reducer with a, a pending action queue that I'm like building up as I go. If the action source is the server, uh, we're going to come back to this action type sync in a second, but if the action source is the server, I am going to put the action into the settled actions queue. Uh, I'm, I call it out here. I'm not 100% sure I'm actually need, I need this, uh, but it seemed like it might be useful for debugging, so I'm going to keep it around for a while. I am going to overwrite the local state with my last known good state. So uh, again, this is inside of Immer. Uh, mutations are allowed, that's how you do it. Uh, but I am essentially going to replace the current state with my last known good state. And then I'm going to apply the, the settled action, the server action to that, to the last known good state. So now, now state is the new last known good. Then my action might be a resolved pending action. So I want to search my pending actions to find uh, any action that is sort of like equal to this one. And if I do find that one, I want to remove it from the pending actions uh, sort of queue or buffer. I'm going to stash settled state. Remember that is the last settled state plus this new action. So uh, uh, the way you do that in Immer is with this current function. It essentially um, flushes any mutations that have been made, uh, and I'm going to store that object as settled state. And then I'm going to loop through my pending actions, and for each of those, uh, apply them to state. So this is like I have a new last known good, and I'm going to reapply local changes that I've made on top of that new last known good. 
Now, in the case that the action type is sync, I am just going to replace state with the payload of that sync event. And then uh, stash that as the last known good settled state and apply any new pending actions. There is never going to be a pending sync action because sync actions are only emitted from the server. The clients are always just emitting sort of input events, uh, input actions. That is my quick tour of how that works. Again, there's, uh, I think, pretty good notes in here about it, and uh, I am uh, open to questions. Uh, before I go, I'm over time slightly, uh, a look at the future. Uh, this is a lot. WebRTC is a lot to set up. Um, uh, and uh, there is this new spec, this new um, API coming out called Web Transport. I think it's already supported in the latest version of Chrome. Uh, it allows the same kind of unreliable to reliable sort of like levers uh, and it has, uh, I think, none of the peer connection establishment stuff. Uh, essentially, it is a, a much nicer replacement for WebRTC data channels if you're not using the audio video portion of WebRTC. Uh, there are some cases where WebSockets still make sense, so it's not necessarily a replacement for that. Uh, also deployment, scaling, and multi-originality. This little, these little infinity symbols mean that there's a, a link here. Uh, there's a really great talk from some folks at a company called Red5 about how they're doing WebRTC scaling on DigitalOcean. Uh, Red5 is about sort of broadcasting video and video streaming, um, but the infrastructure, scaling, relays, uh, kind of all the problems that they're solving about um, uh, forwarding UDP traffic through uh, ingress servers uh, would apply to uh, a kind of uh, multi-regional or, or production-grade uh, RTC deployment implementation. Uh, and lastly, Dino Deploy uh, is a cloud a sort of CDN with a Dino runtime that um, lets, uh, lets Dino run at edge uh, on, on sort of like edge functions. And uh, the interesting thing about it here is that Dino edge nodes can communicate with one another via an implementation of the broadcast channel API, which comes from the browser. It's how you would talk between browser tabs or between browser windows. Uh, however, Dino implements it so that you can talk between edge nodes. It seems like you could probably set something up where edge nodes are running WebRTC, um, uh, WebRTC servers with clients that are geographically proximate to that edge node, but then edge nodes might communicate with one another, all sort of like within the network, which is theoretically over, you know, um, fiber optic cable and 60% of the speed of light or something like that. Uh, this is just something that would be like really interesting to uh, explore, see what the um, performance characteristics are like and uh, whether or not um, Dino Deploy will sort of forward the UDP traffic, stuff like that. I'm not a DevOps guy myself, so if I start having to configure Ingress servers, uh, it's going to take me a little while, but that is where I uh, am looking next. Uh, so that has been my talk. Thank you very much for your time. I'm just going to kind of run out the clock with a uh, pretty stuff.